It's His glory. Amen. Come on, can you give the Lord praise and honor? It's not about a man. It's not about a church. It's all about Jesus. It is in Him that we live and move and have our being. And I'm so thankful this morning to give all glory and honor and praise unto the Lord. When we get to heaven, John the Revelator peeked into heaven and he saw heaven and they were gathered around the throne and they were singing worthy and glory and honor and power belongs unto he, amen, who is risen. Can we give the Lord praise this morning and just thank the Lord for Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, worship team. I could just sing right here, I promise you, and worship. I sense his presence, but I want to I wanna preach the word that I know God has given me, so I'm going to release you. Let's give this praise team a good hand this morning. I want you just to remain standing with me if you're able to do that. It's so good to see all of you this morning. Thank you for being faithful to your church. Thank you for, for loving your church. Your, I've said this for years. Your attendance... Uh, when these doors are open for anything, your attendance here speaks volumes, and it is a vote that you believe this church should stay open. Come on. Because if, if, if you didn't come, and you didn't come, and you didn't come, there are uh, uh, about 16,000 churches a year that shut their doors and lock them and sell their property, and they become a community center, they become a museum, they become a library, they become something else. So every time you come to church, you are casting a vote that says, I believe in Oak Park Church. I believe in the ministry of this church to this city. And I'm glad this morning that hundreds of you have decided that this is a place that this city needs. And thank you for casting that vote today to keep these doors open and preaching the gospel. Amen. You say, Pastor, that's a little hyperbole. No, it's the truth. You let, you let that happen piece by piece, and I have seen it. I dealt with one situation this week that uh, that's exactly what's happened. It's like the old thing, open the church, you know, there's the church, there's the steeple, open the doors, there's no people. And so it's no longer a church because the church is not this structure, the church is you. And so I just, one more time, want you to give yourself a good hand. I know you got your Bibles in your hand, but the best you can, give yourself a hand for getting up and coming to church. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 2 Kings, chapter 3. I want to read several verses this morning. Will you hand me my glasses, Brother Justin? Oh, my goodness. I'm going to preach on healing one of these days and have you all put mud in my eyes or something. It says in 2 Kings 3 and 6, And King Jehoram went out of Samaria the same time and numbered all Israel. And he went and sent to Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, saying, the king of Moab hath rebelled against me. Wilt thou go with me against Moab to battle? And he said, I will go up. I am as you are, my people as your people, and my horses as your horses. And he said, which way shall we go? And he answered, the way through the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom, and they marched on that roundabout route seven days. Days. I want you to pay note to that. And there was no water for the army, nor for the animals that followed them. And the king of Israel said, Alas, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there no prophet of the Lord here, that we may inquire of the Lord by him? So one of the servants of the king of Israel answered and said, Elisha, the son of Shaphat, is here. He's the one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. Now, I want to skip to verse 15 if we have that. And let's read. But now bring me a musician, a minstrel, a psalmist. Then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind nor shall you see rain, yet that valley shall be filled with water, so that you, your cattle, and your army, your animals may drink. Verse 18. And this is a simple matter in the sight of the Lord. He will also deliver the Moabites into your hand. 
Also, you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city and shall cut down every good tree and stop up every spring of water and ruin every good piece of land with stones. I want to preach today on dig a ditch. And I, it's going to make some sense to you, I hope, as we get going today. This is one uh, passage of Scripture that has always been a great scripture in the Bible. I've only preached out of it one time, and I looked in my notes, and I keep detailed notes of when I preach what and where I preach it. And I preached out of this text one time in April of 1997. And this is the first time I've preached out of this text since then. But last night, about 8 o'clock, the Lord began to speak this word to me very clearly and took me to this passage of scripture. And I believe it is a word in due season for some people in this room today. And I believe that God's going to speak to our heart. How many will open your heart to receive the word this morning? Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you for your presence that is not here by accident because I heard the sounds of people crying out to you early this morning in this house. And Lord, I know that they were asking you to come and saturate this place with your presence, to make us aware of your presence. And today, God, you are certainly here we're not looking for you in some other place. We're asking you to come and fill this place in this moment. And God, we give you praise and glory and honor that in these next few moments, you're going to speak to us. You're going to touch our lives, and we will leave this place never the same. And we ask it all today in Jesus' name. And the church said, amen and amen. You may be seated. As we read this text that we read this morning, up to this point, the king of Israel, whose name was Joram, was betrayed by the king of Moab. Joram was the son of Ahab and Jezebel. He had inherited the kingdom of Israel. Every year, Moab had to pay thousands, a uh, 100,000 lambs, the Bible says, and the wool of a 100,000 rams to the king of Israel. It was almost like a, a tax, maybe even an extortion, but nevertheless, Moab, Moab had failed to meet their end of the bargain. This particular year, Moab decided they were not going to pay this tax. They were not going to pay this fee. Well, but since old King Ahab had died and Jeram, his son, took his place, the king of Moab, Moab decided that he was no longer going to pay the taxes that they had paid for generations. Joram, the king of Israel, did what he felt he had to do. He mobilized his troops. He called his allies for help. He called the king of Edom, and he called the king of Judah. You remember in these days, the, uh, Israel was uh, away from God. Judah was the northern part of the kingdom that had served God. Most of their kings were godly kings. And one of their kings, their king at this time, was a young man by the name of Jehoshaphat. And so Joram, the king of Israel, calls the king of Edom, and he, he, uh, he calls for the king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat and the king of Eden both answered back and said, yes, we will go. But they said, which way are we going to go? Joram, the king of Israel, answered back, one of the three kings that were a part of this alliance. And he said, we will go through the desert of Edom. And they began to map somewhat of a strategy, although they didn't know the terrain and they didn't really know the direction for certain that they would go to get to Moab. There was no GPS. There were no maps as we would have them today. And so they just followed the signs and they began to move through Edom to Moab. So those three kings, they take off with all three of their great armies, the armies of Edom, the armies of Judah, the armies of Israel. And they began to march through the valley of Edom in pursuit of the enemy Moab. The Bible says that Moab, of course, you know, means sin. They were going to conquer. If you take that top and shadow, they were on their way to conquer the, the nation of sin. So how many know that we're conquering sin in our life? You got to see those types in this story. So the three kings, not to mention all of their armies, here's what begins to happen. The three kings, not to mention all of their armies and their animals, found themselves in a desperate position, a desperate situation. This is a dilemma. The Bible tells us that there was no water. 
They had marched for seven days. They took off on their course, on their way to Moab to conquer sin, but there was no water. Now, when there's no water, it's a dilemma because when you have an army and you have kings and you have animals upon which you're depending to get you to that destination, water is a necessity of life. It's not a luxury. It is something that is necessary to sustain life. If you don't have water, you will die. And now they are seven days into this journey. They say three days, four days without water and you will die. I don't know how long they've been without water. I know they've been on the journey for seven days. They didn't expect to travel those days and they would expect to find water along their journey. But here they are in the desert of Edom without water knowing that they're going to die. The king of Israel starts blaming. This is the son of Ahab and Jezebel. He starts blaming God for their dilemma. Now, it's not God's fault they're dry. It's their fault. They find themselves in a dry place because they decided to go that direction into a dry place. And now they're going out to this battle, and the king of Israel, uh, he's, he's there, and he begins to blame God. But it's his fault, not God's fault. And this king, Joram, is a bad influence. If it hadn't been for King Jehoshaphat, who loved the Lord and he trusted God, he knew the power that would come from a word of God. He knew that if they could get a word from Jehovah God, that one word could change everything. And he asked a question. He asked a word. He said, is there, is there not a prophet? Is there not a prophet that can speak to this situation? Is there not someone who can hear from God and can speak to this situation, who can inquire from the Lord? Now, Jehoshaphat, the reason he asked that question is because Jehoshaphat asked a rhetorical question because he knew the answer to that question. He knew that there was a God who would give them a word, and if God gave them a word, that he was a God that could not lie. He's not man that he should lie, lie neither the son of man that he should repent. And Jehoshaphat knew in this crisis, if I can just get a word from God, one word from God will change everything. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place this morning. Listen, you need to surround your, yourself with people that know that one word from God can change everything. It doesn't matter where you found yourself. It doesn't matter what the circumstances look like. It doesn't matter what you've been through. And it doesn't really matter where you are. If you can get a word from God, I'm telling you, one word from God will do what a lawyer cannot do for you. One word from God will do what a bank, when the banker says no to the loan, one word from God will open up the heavens and pour you out a blessing you don't have room enough to receive. Amen. One bad word from a doctor, but one word from God can change that diagnosis of cancer, that diagnosis of diabetes. One word from God changes everything. The devil may come and try to destroy your marriage, but one word from God says what? God has joined together. Let no man put asunder. We need a word. We need a word. So the prophet Elisha comes and he declares something. Justin, will you help me? He declares something. He says, I want you to make this valley full of ditches. Now, that's not exactly the word that you want to hear. When you're thirsty and you're tired and you're weary and you're out there needing something, what they were hoping for was that the Lord's word would come to them and say, yeah, there's a place, there's a well over here that somebody else dug that you can go get water from. There's a, there's a well over here that's, thank you, there's a well, that looks like a well-used shovel right there. There's a well over here where somebody else has labored in, and somebody else has prayed down, and somebody else dug up, and somebody else dug into and found water and found life. What they wanted to do was just stroll right over to somebody else's well and drink of water, but that's not what God told them. What God says is, I want you to dig a ditch right where you are. Now, I'm going to preach. If y'all don't help me today, if y'all want to act like a bunch of Presbyterians, I'm going to preach like a Pentecostal. It's your choice. But I'm going to tell you, you can, they were there. They were stuck in a dry place. The prophet came to them and said, I want you to do something for yourself. I want you to dig a ditch right where you are. Place a ditch in the place. Ah, 
That's made just for that. Praise God. And the prophet declares, make this valley. Anybody ever been in a valley? God says, while you're in the valley, don't go looking for somebody else's well. Don't go looking for somebody else's water. He said, I'm about to do something for you that you, and I'm about to preach about it. I'm about to do something for you that's bigger than your temporary thirst. I'm about to do something for you that's not just going to meet your situation, but if you run from this moment and you fail to prepare a place for the water that I'm about to give you where you are, then you are going to miss the victory that's on the other side of this thing. Now, I'm preaching ahead of myself, but if, if you've ever dug ditches, then you know. I've dug a few ditches. If you've ever dug ditches, especially with that shovel, because that's not a shovel you dig ditches with. But we're going to use it today because I forgot my shovel. <laughs> that's going to make it extra hard <laughs> to dig with that shovel. So if you're going to dig ditches, you know it's hard work. And it's especially hard work when the ground is dry. I grew up on Sand Mountain where it's a lot like the soil here. You just stick a shovel in it and it was just sand. I moved down into the valley into Trenton, Georgia, and it's nothing but rock. I'm telling you, it's a whole different ball game when you're trying to dig in the rock and in the old Georgia clay. And you would try to dig a hole. I'm telling you, you'd almost need to dynamite to plant a bush in the valley. In the valley. And they were in the valley. In the valley, it's not like the mountaintop where you may have some soft soil. They were in a place that was, that was tough terrain. It was rocky terrain. Here they are in the wilderness in a dry place. Notice the imagery that the Bible gives us so clearly. They were in a dry place, we know. We know they were in a valley place. We know that they were in a low place. They were in a low place. They were in a valley place. They were in a dry place. And it was in this place, in this low, dry, desert place that God, through the prophet of God, said, I want you to stay right where you are, dig ditches, and depend on my provision. It, it, was, it was hard. It was slow. It was difficult work. I don't even know if they had shovels. Maybe it was just their hands and some kind of tool. And he didn't say dig a ditch. He said make this valley full of ditches. Fill this place with ditches. I'm sure their, their hands were, were blistered. Their backs were sore. Their arms were aching. Their shoulders were aching. And, and to top all that off, as they're digging, the reason that they're digging is because they're thirsty. Have you ever worked when you were thirsty? And you, 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 you lose your momentum, you lose your energy, you lose your ability, but here they're working at it. See, I want to stop and tell you this morning, I'm talking to some people who have been in that same place, in a dry place, in a valley place, in a place where it's difficult, in a place where it takes great effort. See, you have to force yourself to dig that ditch. You have to force yourself to praise the Lord. You have to force yourself to pray. You have to force yourself to read the Bible. You have to force yourself to go to church. And when you're doing it, it feels like you're so dry. Am I talking to anybody? It feels like you're so dry. It feels like you're so empty. It feels like your mind is telling you, this is ridiculous. What are you doing? doing? Why are you still here? Why are you still digging this ditch? And it feels like you're so dry. It feels like you're so empty. It feels ridiculous. The devil's trying to tell you it's over. It's dead. Put your shovel up. Quit digging. Go try to find somebody else's well that's went through what you're going through right now but succeeded and it's never going to happen. Those dreams and visions, those prophecies he'll tell you are never going to happen. That word that God spoke over your life is never going to happen. You're never going to launch that ministry. You're never going to see your children saved. You're never going to start that business. You're never going to get out of debt. And when you look at your present circumstances and, and you go by what you're feeling, the temptation is to believe him. The temptation is to believe that what the enemy is telling you because it aligns with your circumstance is true. But somebody needs to make up in your mind 
you need to get in your spirit that you're going to hold on to the promise, that you're going to hold on to the prophecy, that you're going to hold on to the dream, that you're going to hold on to the vision that you've been dreaming. Listen, I know it's hard. I know it's difficult. I know sometimes it doesn't make sense. I know sometimes that it doesn't feel like it. But you have to keep digging. Listen, you may be in the greatest drought season of your life. Everything around you seems to be drying up. But the only way you get through it is if you keep on moving. Come on, nudge somebody beside you and say, keep moving. Listen. Listen, it's, it's time to keep on digging, keep on praying, keep on praising, keep on believing, keep on sowing, keep on coming to church, keep on paying your tithes. What do you do when you go through the fire? You keep on walking. What do you go, what do you do when you face the Red Sea in front of you and you see Pharaoh's army behind you? You just trust God to open up that Red Sea and just keep on walking. What do you do when you find yourself in the valley of the shadow of death? You fear no evil because God is with you and you just keep on walking. Come on, turn to somebody again and say, just keep on walking. Come on, tell them, keep on walking. What you don't realize, what you may not realize is in that low, dry place, when you're digging and your hands are sore and your back is bruised and your shoulders are weary, you got dirt in your hair and in your mouth and under your fingernails, what you don't realize in that moment, in that moment, is that you are preparing a landing strip for the glory of God to manifest. In those moments when you are weary and you're tired and you're exhausted, you are preparing a place for God to pour himself into. I, the Lord spoke to me last Tuesday and said it's time that we prepare a place for his glory. See, if I can just stop here, this is not my message, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to charge you any extra for this. We come in here to this building sometimes, I'm guilty, and we are so full. We're filled with the cares of this world. We're filled with frustrations. We're filled with distractions. We're filled with worldly, carnal things that fill us up. And we come in here so full of all of that that there's no place for God's glory to fill us. We have not prepared a place for it. And so we come in here and we try to lift our hands, but we're full. You ever, you, I remember when Kim was sick with her back surgery and the church, when we were there, just like this church, they were so kind and, and they would bring, they would call me and say, they didn't coordinate it well though. They'd say, can we bring a meal over? And I'd be, well, that'd be great. You know, the kids were all still at home. And so I had one lady one afternoon, she brought, I'm talking about, filled our table up with pots and pans. And about 30 minutes later, somebody else knocked on the door, had the same thing. And I look out the window, and I'm having to hide all those pots and pans so they don't see them, so they're not offended by it. So I'm like sticking everything in the refrigerator, trying to just get it from them. And, and I'm like, we'd already eaten that other stuff. And I'm like, I'm so thankful for what they brought, but I was so full. She brought my favorite food. But I was so full, I couldn't eat it. I couldn't take it. And we come to church sometimes so full that we've got a banquet table of God's glory and God's grace, but we're so filled that we haven't prepared a place to receive what God has. And we come in here, and I'm telling you, Oak Park Church is the greatest church on the planet. This worship, it doesn't come any better than this worship. Amen. I'm glad 80 of y'all agree with me. It's the greatest church in this world. And, and when we come together, we come in here, there is the opportunity for you to be filled. But we have to prepare a reservoir for God to fill. If we're full, we can't contain anymore. So, the prophet said, make this valley full of ditches. Listen, you're creating the capacity to receive a greater glory. If you don't prepare the place, then God has nowhere to abide. Amen. He said, I want you to prepare a place, dig these ditches, a greater power, a greater anointing, a greater blessing than you've ever had in your life. Listen, I know the devil meant to kill you. I know that he meant to drive you away from the church. I know that he went, meant to convince you that your life was hopeless. I know it's been hard. I know for some of you it's been dry. I know you've been in a valley. I know you've been in a dry place, in a low place. But understand, this word, this text tells us it's just a setup. God 
God is just setting you up for a come. Your setback is only a setup for a comeback. If you'll just get your spiritual shovel and start digging your valley full of ditches. Don't just sit in the valley and complain about a dry valley. Get a shovel in your hand and prepare for the glory of the Lord. Dig a ditch of praise. Dig a ditch of prayer. Dig a ditch of faithfulness. Amen. God is not unrighteous to forget your labor of love. Paul says in Galatians, be not weary in well-doing, knowing this. Knowing this. Don't be weary in well-doing, knowing that you will reap in due season if you faint not. This is somebody's due season. Anybody? I know I'm not preaching to everybody. I'm preaching to somebody. Because some folks, you're just so full. you full as a tick. But there's some folks just empty. You're saying, God, empty me. It hit me a moment ago. I had to hit my knees when it said it's all about you. You deserve the glory. You deserve the honor. Let me be very clear, very, very, very clear. I don't look to man to affirm me at all. It bothers me. Some things really, really bother me in my flesh. But I don't look to man to affirm me. Because he deserves the glory. And the same people that yet that talked to Jesus and cried Hosanna at the beginning of the week nailed him to a cross at the end of the week. You can't depend on people. This is somebody's due season. It's a new season. Elijah said, I hear the sound. This is what Elijah said on Mount Carmel. He said, he said I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. He picked something, Pastor Ricky, he picked something up in the spirit. He said, I hear a sound. Now, if you're not listening, you won't hear it. Somebody said, well, the wind's not blowing. It's because it shifted and you haven't adjusted your sails. The wind started blowing in the upper room on the day of Pentecost, and the wind of the Holy Ghost has not stopped blowing since. The difference is we have not adjusted our sails to the current breeze. We have to adapt to what God is doing. I believe today somebody's picking it up in the Spirit. Elijah heard a sound. Somebody has, has to catch the sound of the abundance of rain in their spirit. Listen, I came today. I, I I'm telling you, I did not come today to preach. I came to prophesy. I come to tell you what I hear the Lord saying, and that's all I can do. I feel an anointing to tell somebody today that your drought is over. If you will prepare a place for God's glory, your drought is over. Hallelujah. It's a new season. It's a new day. Fresh anointing is coming your way. It's not time to doubt. It's not time to pout. It's not time to do without it's time to make that valley full of ditches and prepare for what God has prepared for you somebody put your hands together and give God praise in this house hallelujah 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 turn to your neighbor and tell them this season is changing it's not going to last always Hallelujah. My whole landscape, my yard that was brown and dead and dry, when I stepped out of the door yesterday, I looked and the things that have been dry are all of a sudden producing life, producing flowers, producing buds. And I know I'm not talking to everybody, but I'm talking to somebody. If you've been in a spiritual drought, then if you've never been in a spiritual drought, this message won't mean anything to you. But there's somebody under the sound of my voice, maybe it's through those camera lens that are listening to this preacher this morning that's been in a dry place and it seems like the heavens are brass and it hasn't rained in a while and it feels like God has moved and didn't leave a forwarding address but I come to tell you that this drought is breaking in the same place I said in the same place where the devil told you it was over. In the same marriage where the devil said it's over. On the same job and business where the devil said it's over. The same children where the devil said it's over. The same ministry where the devil said it was over. The same church where the devil said it was over. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain and I'm going to dig some ditches and say let it rain, let it rain, let it rain. Glory to God. 
in the same place where the enemy said, I'm going to destroy you. Amen. I'm going to destroy your ministry. I'm going to destroy your marriage. I'm going to destroy your family. I'm going to destroy your health. I'm going to destroy you financially. In that same place is where the prophet said, prepare for the rain. Prepare for the provision. And I come to tell you, you're getting ready to tap into a fresh anointing and a brand new supply of the glory and the power of God. And you're going to rise with a new boldness and a new faith and a new determination, a new anointing, and you're going to go into the enemy's camp and take back the things that the enemy has tried to steal from you. There is a drought-breaking anointing coming upon the church of the living God. I feel somebody up in here getting their faith. Somebody, somebody right now is standing up on the inside and saying, I'm getting ready to dig some ditches. Somebody has caught the scent of water. I heard the, I didn't know what that meant. Last night I was preparing this message and I was just, and I, and I thought about Elijah, what I just shared with you, how Elijah heard the sound. I heard the Holy Ghost tell me. Somebody, and I wrote it down right there. I typed it out and wrote it down. Somebody has caught the scent of water. And I thought that doesn't even make sense. I was talking about the sound of rain. But the scripture says, the prophet said to them, dig ditches, but it's not going to thunder or lightning or rain, and the wind's not going to blow. Come on. Now, how does that happen? Come on. He said, I'm going to fill these ditches, but you're not going to see rain. Come on. You're not going to hear the wind. You're not going to feel the lightning. See, some of y'all that are listening to me, probably all those watching outside of here, y'all ready for another bump? There's folks that chase stuff like dogs in heat. Selah. Just chasing after people. Chasing after stuff. Chasing after if I can hear my right song. If I can hear the right preacher. If I can go to the right place. No. God said, get your shovel, roll up your sleeves, get you a towel because you're going to sweat and make a valley full of ditches in the place where you are. I'm going to preach this if it I'm not going to say it. <laughs> Scent of water. What does that even mean? I didn't know what it meant. I started, I, I had to figure it out because I knew the Holy Ghost dropped it on me. And I looked over at the book of Job. Over in the book of Job, there's an interesting, obscure passage. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. It's not the first book in, in uh, the way it's listed in the Bible. Genesis, of course, is. But Job was the first book of the Bible written. It's the oldest book. Moses came along way after Job and wrote Genesis. Job is the oldest book in the Bible. Job is a book of science. There was not, the word science was not even invented. Nobody had ever heard of a scientist. No, nobody had ever heard of an archaeologist. No one had ever heard of a geologist when Job Job's story in Job's book is recorded. All Job had, he didn't, have, he didn't have any scripture. He didn't have a prophet. All he had was God speaking to him. That's all he had. And for 37 chapters of Job, God's not speaking to Job. And then in chapter 38, it says, and then the Lord answered Job. And right at the very end, the Lord begins to talk to Job. And when he talks to him, he explains how the earth works. If you'll, read the, if you'll read the book of Job, you'll discover that God told Job the earth was round when man thought the earth was flat. In the book of Job, God tells Job that the sun shines. God makes the sun to shine and the moon to reflect the sun before there was ever an astronaut or a satellite went into space. God explained that to Job. And here's what Job chapter 14 and verse 7 says. For there is hope of a tree. If it be cut down, that it will sprout again, and that the tender branch thereof will not cease. Though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground. You cut a tree down all the way to the root. It, there's a chance that it's going to grow back. Anybody a testimony of that that's ever tried to kill a tree? <laughs> Yet, through the scent of water. I just searched scent of water, and here's what I come up with. Yet, through the scent of water. It will bud and bring forth like a plant. Did you hear that? 
It didn't say that it had to have the touch of water. It didn't say that it had to feel the water. It said just from the scent of water, it'll bud and bring forth again. Just from the scent of it. Man, oh man. I began to think about something I heard a long time ago or read somewhere. And I validated it again before I preached it today. Anybody ever walked outside and say, it smells like rain? The scent of rain. My Lord, help me preach this. When you walk outside and you smell what is the scent of rain, it's not the rain you're smelling. It's what Job describes here. Before there was ever a scientist that described it, Job understood it because God told him. You're not smelling the rain. When the rain, when the clouds begin to form and the rain begins to form in the clouds, there is a phenomenon that happens to every living thing. The grass, the trees, the, the flowers, they began to open up their pores. Jesus, Holy Ghost, help me. They began to open themselves up because of the anticipation of the scent of rain. And so the grass begins to prepare itself to receive the rain. The flowers open up to receive the rain. My God in heaven, there's a rain that's coming. I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I can smell it. You know what I smell? I smell some folks, they looking for somebody else as well, but I smell somebody getting a ditch and opening up and saying, here I am, Holy Ghost, rain on me, rain on me. Come on, somebody help me praise him. Because when you praise him, you're preparing a place. When you give him glory, you're preparing a place. Hallelujah. When you pray, you're preparing a place. Amen. When you give God glory and honor, you're preparing a place. Now watch this. I've got I've to hasten to a close. Listen, the scent of water, I smell it. I smell something, but it's not the water that I smell. I smell breakthrough in the air. I smell breakthrough opening up. I smell miracles opening up. I smell revival. I smell, and listen, revival's not just scheduling three services or four services on a calendar. Revival's when your drug addict kid gets saved and delivered. Revival is when you get on fire for God once again. Revival is when God gets your focus back. I feel, I smell it. I smell the wind shifting. I smell a shift in the atmosphere. Amen, it was hot and dry, but I feel a change. There's humidity in the air. There's rain, there's moisture in the air. And you can say, I may not see a difference yet, but the atmosphere tells me that it's about to rain. Listen, somebody... Somebody needs to just lift your hands up right now and say, God, here I am. Rain on me. Come on. Right now, just take about 10 seconds and just say, God, here I am. Rain on me. Hallelujah. (laughs) No wonder. No wonder. No wonder the devil's fought you so hard. No wonder you've went through the battles you've went through. No wonder you've faced the attacks you've faced. Because God's getting ready to, ready to fill your ditch. And the size of your ditch determines the capacity of your blessing. Ah, oh, don't miss that. The size of the ditch you dig determines the capacity of your blessing. We prepare the place. He fills it. I want to dig large ditches. Not with shovels. Find me a track hole. (laughs) Dig deep. Dig wide. Because I believe the blessings of the Lord is coming. Listen, i got to close. The Bible says, here's what he said to him. He said, you will not see, you will not see wind nor rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water. Somebody today, I hope you'll stick with me for five minutes and let me close this message for you exit on me this this morning because I want you to get this. See, he couldn't see the water anywhere around him. He, the king, the prophet, the kings thought they would die of thirst, thought that, that they would just have to quit. The devil thought that you would quit. The devil thought you would thirst to death. The devil thought that just before you broke through in the place, at the right time, at the right place, at the right moment, 
he thought that the devil thought that right at that moment you were going to shift out of it that you were going to find another place another time another moment another another something but when you're faithful in the few things hallelujah you get to that place where God's about to bring you on in to the next place of your miracle amen and you've dug that ditch and you're there at the breakthrough of that moment the devil thought that you were that you were that you were done until you started digging ditches when you picked up a shovel when you picked up a praise when you picked up a prayer when you picked up a victory and you started digging ditches you messed the devil's mind up because he thought he had you the devil thought that you were shallow he thought your faith was shallow he thought your praise was shallow he thought your victory was shallow he thought it was all on the surface he thought it was all crusty amen that it was all about emotions and he thought as soon as it got rough and as soon as you got in the valley and as soon as you got in a dry place that he had you but all of a sudden you started picking up a praise and you started digging ditches amen and I've got a word for you before I quit I want to tell you again somebody's season is changing waters on the way it's going to get better weeping may endure for the night but joy comes in the morning why because I got a word and the word says make this valley full of ditches <laughs> Stand with me and let me close. Stand with me and that'll, that'll push me. Listen, 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 listen. Ah, this is where it gets good right here. Because that's good, right? That's good. It's good that, that the Bible says that they woke up the next morning and there was water in the ditches. Now they got water to drink. The kings have water to drink. The soldiers have water to drink. The animals have water to drink. But that's not the end of the story. Because these old wicked Moabites that Israel and Edom and Judah had went out to conquer. They come up on this valley of Edom where these three nations and three kings had found themselves and they encircled themselves with this valley of ditches and the next morning God filled it with water. The Moabites get up on this mountaintop and your Bible says that there was a mirage because the way the sun hit the water, they thought that it was blood. And when they saw that valley, they thought the valley was filled with blood because they thought these three allies had turned on each other and killed one another. So they decided that they were going to go collect the spoils. So with their short swords in their sheath, with their weapons on the mountaintop, they just kind of stroll, the enemy just kind of strolls on down. Because God told them, I will bring the enemy to you. They're trying to pursue the enemy. But here they are enjoying the blessings of God, filling the ditches. But then God brings the enemy to them where they didn't have to go to the enemy. The enemy comes to them just kind of tiptoeing and strolling in. But when they cross the bloodline, when they cross those ditches, that look like blood and when they cross the bloodline they fail to their defeat it's the greatest story of retribution in all of the Bible because when they crossed over what they thought was blood amen Israel and Judah and Edom took control of them and defeated sin defeated the Moabites I come to tell somebody God doesn't just want to give you a blessing for a moment he wants to take out your enemy he wants to remove that battle for good. He wants to remove that temptation out of your life for good. Hallelujah. I'm telling you what, I feel the Holy Ghost in this room this morning. I believe there's somebody today, listen, we're going to have church this morning. I know it's Sunday school time almost, but this morning there's somebody who needs to get your spiritual shovel and you need to prepare a place for what God has prepared for you. You can't make it rain. You can't make it, you can't produce water. But what I can do is put my hand to the plow, put my hand to the shovel, and I can make this dry place. I can make this valley full of ditches. And when I can't find it, I can praise my way into a blessing. Hallelujah, I can pray my way into a blessing. I can faith my way into a blessing. I need somebody that says, Pastor David, I'm ready to put my hand on the shovel of praise and I'm ready to prepare a ditch 
for the reign of the Holy Ghost. I want you to get out of your seat, make your way to this altar as quickly as you can. As qu I'm not going to beg, I'm just going to ask. If you're ready for the rain, I'm telling you the water. I don't know if it came from the rain. I don't know if it came from the ground. I don't know how it's going to come. All I know is I'm saying, God, I'm preparing a place for you. Come on. Come on. Give God praise. Come on. Praise Him. Prepare a ditch. Dig some ditches right now. Come on. You're digging a ditch right where you are. You're digging a ditch right now. You're preparing a ditch. Shit, Ted.